hip, hip, hooray for DNA. It provides the key to the plans for making everything in you and me. The 1940s actually a period of, of great discovery. So 1940s was particularly important for DNA itself. So DNA was more and more understood in the 1940s, especially early 1940s. And before Watson and Crick, who we're going to talk about in this video, before they came about, there was someone called Chagafs, and Chagaf made a, discovered a link or a ratio. He realized that A and T and G and C were always at the same ratio. So for example, if there were, let's say, five bases of A, there would always be five bases of T. And if there were five, ten bases of G, there would always be 10 bases of C were found within DNA itself. And that makes sense because we know that A and T always pair together and G and C always pair together. So if there's a G, there must also be a C link to it. That's what Shagav realized. He didn't actually realize the significance or the importance of DNA, but he realized that DNA had these different molecules, had these different same ratios of A and T and G and C. Now, someone called Rosalind Franklin and Morris Wilkinson they worked on this, which is a X-ray crystallograph. And it's basically just a picture of DNA. So this was a picture of DNA, and this was mostly done in the early 1940s as well. Now, this was basically the first time we saw DNA itself, and this was going to be later used to make a model of DNA. And also, we, again, we knew about chromosomes and genes, and because of the earlier discoveries in 19, early 1941, by beetle and tandem that one gene made one protein. We now knew what genes actually did. They made proteins, but we still didn't know how. Obviously, we know now that DNA was very much involved when it comes to making protein, but they only knew that genes made proteins. They didn't know how exactly those genes made those proteins. But this all changed in the 1940s, and this is what we're going to cover in this video. I'll read the actual point. It says, students will cross information from secondary sources to describe and analyze the relative importance of the work of James Watson, Francis Crick, Rosalind Franklin, and Morris Wilkinson in determining the structure of DNA and the impact of the quality of collaboration and communication on their scientific research. So, two parts. First, we're going to think about the importance of these individual scientists and then talk about the impact of their teamwork that led to the discovery of DNA. So the first part is, who are these scientists? Well, you can you think of them as teams of two. Morris Wilkinson and Rosalind Franklin, these were both British scientists, British, British scientists, and they were work, working on DNA itself. And James Watson and Francis Crick, these were both working together, but they were working in America because they were American scientists. Uh, they were all working on the structure of DNA. James Watson and Francis Crick specifically always tried to make a model of DNA. So now we obviously have the model of DNA, which is that uh, the helical structure that is twisted around. It has these bases in the middle. It has a phosphate backbone. It has the ribose sugar. All of that stuff. That was known when they were when they were doing their research. That tried that's what actually what they figured out. So those two figured out the model of DNA. And what Rosalind and Franklin did is they took the molecule. So the DNA itself is a molecule. We knew about DNA long before these people discovered the model of DNA, but for many years we didn't actually realize that DNA was in any way important. We just knew it was a molecule that was for some reason in the nucleus. We didn't know that DNA was coding for anything. But that's what they obviously did. They proved that it is important. But what they did, so what Rosalind and Franklin did, was they made a crystal picture of DNA. If you want to make a model, if, so if you want to be able to make a nice model, you need to be able to see it somehow. I mean, you can make it, if you don't have any way to see it, it's hard to make a good prediction. And Rosalind Franklin and Morris Wilkinson gave the other two scientists a tool to be able to make a model because they made a crystallized DNA. And again, this was the crystallized DNA. And even though Rosalind Franklin and Morris Wilkinson, they couldn't, they didn't actually do too much with this actual picture. They didn't manage to decipher the model of DNA. But what actually happened is um, Morris Wilkinson, he was a 
very sort of f not famous, or he was uh, had a high standing as a scientist. He was quite a famous scientist. Whereas Rosalind um, Franklin, she because she was a woman and females and women didn't have a high ranking back then, especially scientists. She was a bit of a nobody. So she was more or less working for Morris Wilkinson, but she was quite talented. So she was the person who actually came up with this picture. So she was the person who made that. Morris Wilkinson didn't really do too much when it comes to making that crystal picture. But what happened is these two scientists, so the American scientists Francis Crick and James Watson, Watson, they were really you know into trying. They were young nobodies. They were unknown scientists, and they tried to figure out this model of DNA. They they always uh, exchanged ideas with, even if they sounded completely crazy, they still followed the ideas. They came up with lots of models, but they could never really get it down perfectly. They knew of Chagall's rule. So the Chagall's rule was that A and T and G and C always were in the same ratios, but they couldn't finalize the actual model. But what happened then one day is Morris Wilkinson, which is this person here, he showed the picture. So he showed this picture here. He showed the picture to the other two American scientists. So he showed the picture to American scientists. And that was enough for James Watson and Francis Crick to finalize their idea and come up with a model of DNA. So the achievement of Rosalind Franklin in particular is to make this crystallized DNA structure. And the achievement of Francis Crick and James Watson was then to actually put that picture, combine it with all the other ideas they had, and make it into a model. We often call it the uh, Watson and Crick, Watson and Crick model of DNA, and that's still accepted today. So their idea was that we have a twisted helix, so that the actual DNA is in a twisted helix, so you can see that's that twisted ladder. And also that you have in the inside of that twisted helix, you have the bases. So the bases are inside the helix. And they figured out that it's hydrogen bondings that keep them together, the bases, the hydrogen bondings. And the cool thing is, I mean, the, the very clever thing is, their model allow ways for the, the, the things to be replicated and for proteins to be produced. So because of their model, if you split adenine and guanine in half, then you can make a complementary copy of it and create new strands of DNA, as we discussed in the replication video, right? So their model allowed replication to occur and allowed protein synthesis to occur. So their model was very good and, and ended up being quite accurate. So this is more or less the stop point. I'll go for the actual bits again. So um, process information from second source to describe and analyze the relative importance of the work of James Watson, Francis Crick, Rosalind Franklin, and Morris Wilkinson in determining structure of DNA. So Rosalind Franklin, and in particular Morris Wilkinson, they came up with this crystallized DNA picture. And then James Watson and Francis Crick used that picture to actually make the model itself. So they, come up, they came up with the model. Those two came up with the model, and those two came up with the picture. Now the other part says, and the impact, the quality of collaboration and the communication on their scientific group. So what impact did their teamwork have? Well, in general, obviously you can see okay, that their, their sharing of ideas helped them to come up with the model because they could use a picture to come up with the model. So the sharing of ideas was quite beneficial, but the only sort of um, sour part, sort of sour grapes in this, is that Rosalind Franklin, the person who made the crystallized DNA picture, didn't give Morris Wilkinson the authority. So she didn't want, she didn't say yes to sharing the picture with James Watson and Francis Crick. So even though they did work in some ways, indirectly they worked together, it wasn't really intentional. I guess it was maybe it was somewhat random. Fra Rosalind Franklin didn't really want it. And Morris Wilkinson actually only showed him the picture, but that was more as a, you know, like a random thing. It wasn't you know, with the intention of helping them come up with the model of DNA. They wanted to do the same thing. They wanted to achieve the same thing first. They were actually in competition with each other. So even though there was teamwork in some way, it was more indirect or random, they weren't really 
wanting to help each other out, really, to the highest degree. And they actually, most of them got the Nobel Prize. So the Nobel Prize went to Francis Crick, to James Watson, and to Morris Wilkinson for discovering the DNA molecule. But it didn't go to Rosalind Franklin. And the reason why is because she had already died beforehand. And you can't give the Nobel Prize to someone who died. So Francis Crick, James Watson, and Morris Wilkinson got recognized for their achievements, whereas Rosalind Franklin didn't. But yeah, so the idea was just, you know, you need to know what each group of scientists did, and she should know a bit about the story behind it as well. So you know, how they were actually competing to try to come up with the model, but then Morris Wilkinson just randomly showed the picture, or more or less randomly showed the picture to the other scientists, and they used that information to come up with the model. I hope that was useful. Thank you for watching.